And let's see who. Robin, so I looked up that error signal. It looks like maybe Zoom can't detect your camera, but I don't know. Yeah, I don't know why not all, all of a sudden. <laughs> um, I'll, um, I'll have to troubleshoot it after. Um, so sorry about that. Um, a question for you, Nate, before we start this meeting, um, is it necessary to read the entire preamble at this point? You could, do uh, just, you could have probably okay. have an abridged version. Okay. Because um, I've just seen other meetings where they don't. Right. Quite as much time. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. So uh, I'll, let's see. Da, 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 da. I could just start with this public meeting, right? Mm -hmm. um, all right, so it's 6.36 p.m. Uh, we have five members in attendance, that's quorum. So I will call to order this meeting um, May 6th of the Amherst Historical Commission. Um, this me public meeting of the town of Amherst Historical Commission is being conducted by remote participation. Members of the public who wish to access the meeting may do so by Zoom or by telephone. No in-person attendance of uh, members of the public will be permitted, but every effort will be made to ensure that the public could adequately access the proceedings in real time via technological means. A hyperlink to the hearing has been, uh, has been posted on the town's online calendar. And I should probably add in this preamble that uh, the meeting is recorded for, for future viewing. So um, we have on our first agenda item, Pull up our agenda here. Uh, any announcements? I was going to say that the town's uh, hired a new planner. Just oh, exciting. And she she may be helping out with the historical commission a little bit. Okay. We're trying to determine roles. She was the planner in Pittsfield for a little over a year, and she had worked at Pioneer Valley Planning Commission before that, and she did staff the historical commission in Pittsfield, and she's worked with CPA, so she could. Um, you know, probably help out pretty quickly. Oh, that's great. When was she at a PVPC? Uh, I think like two years ago. She had been doing, oh, okay. I think with them, she had been doing more green communities and uh, uh -huh. bike head stuff. Okay, great. What was her name again? Jacinta Williams. Okay, great. Hooray. That's good news for you, Nate, right? <laughs> it is, yeah. We're, well, uh, another planner is leaving Rob um, with Chilla, who's oh, no. at CBA. So at the same time, we're bringing someone on, someone's leaving. So we might be uh, picking up some other other boards or committees and things to do. Okay. All right. Does anyone on the commission have any announcements? The only thing I can think off the top of my head is that um, uh, Historic New England... Uh, is having its, I think this will be its third annual preservation conference in the fall. Um, I've seen announcements for it. Um, and it's going to be in Portland, Maine this year, I think. So people are interested in exploring that possibility. Um, that's all I've got for right now. Okay, so next agenda item. Um, is a question for me essentially uh, for the town, um, an update on our exploration of looking into funds for a historic survey plan so that the, we could develop a plan to pursue, um, um, to pursue, pursue a, a phased surveys that could be hopefully in part funded by, by grant money. Any input on that, Nate? from the town? No, I had um, asked the planning director, we do have some capital funds. Um, it probably wouldn't be available until next year. Um, we're waiting just for a few things, uh, some other products that are ongoing now to determine their final budgets. But I think okay. it was something that would be willing to look into. Okay, and still no, um, we're still not pursuing the idea that we could um, get a CPA fund match for that. Well, yeah, or, I mean, or CPA I'll, funds, rather CPA administrative funds, and and I I don't know how what's what is in that account. I mean, usually I know it's used to pay for dues for the 
sepia coalition and all that, but. Um... Yeah, let me, you know, I, after our last meeting, I done a quick follow-up and I think I need to just making a note to myself right now to do a little bit more on that. Um, yeah, so no updates. You know, the, the uh, town's planning department does have some capital funds year to year. And so it's, the new fiscal year starts July 1. And so um, I'm assuming after once we, like I said, there's two ongoing projects, we just have to see where they'll end um, in their budget. And then we can, there might be some money there too to, to do a little bit of this. Okay. Okay. Um, any questions from commissioners on that item? Okay. Um, agenda item number four, um, inventory updates for recent demolitions. Um, I'm full of good intentions and I have no good updates. <laughs> That's Robin, good. I was gonna say, uh, Seth is here from Amherst College. That had been put in as the second agenda item. Oh, okay. Oh, I'm sorry. I skipped right over it, didn't I? Let's go back to number two. Seth, I'm going to bring you, um, promote you to panelists, so you'll be asked to rejoin. That way you can share a screen or other things. Hello, everyone. Hello. Hello. Thanks for joining us. Of course. Um, so, um, I'd go ahead and, uh, did, did you, did you want to, did you have a comment, Nate, or? Yeah, I was going to say that, I, I think I prefaced this earlier, that the uh, council voted to approve the sign on the common uh, last week. I, I still think it's worthwhile, uh, Seth, to have you here just for a quick conversation and maybe some ideas. And, you know, I think if the commission has some concerns or considerations, I would still forward them on to town council and staff just so that it's there. I know the commission looked a while ago. Um, I think it was actually maybe a few years ago at this. It's changed a little bit. So I just, I wanted to bring it back to them just so they could look at it again in light of everything that's happened on the common in terms of the, the improvements and wayfinding signs and everything. Yeah. So as uh, Nathan mentioned, this has been a longer running uh, project than kind of initially foreseen. So it's involved um, conversations with the design review board, the historical, the historical commission from, I guess it was 2021, many, many meetings with the planning board, multiple meetings with the town council, meetings with the town services and outreach, and a few others. And so um, I thought, I'm allowed to share my screen right Yeah, Okay. I thought it'd be good just to, to back up a second and give a, a little bit of context that's not so specific to the this particular sign. So all right, so let's see here. So the college in, uh, I guess it was 2020, engaged a signage designer to develop a comprehensive set of signs for the college. And that's because we really don't have any. If you've ever walked around campus, you'll see a few prototypes now, which are part of this package. But historically, the college has never had any signs. And that means wayfinding signs for vehicles. That means parking signs other than some um, kind of um, mundane parking signs about, you know, what types of permits you need, but not about where you should try to find parking, about when you've entered the campus versus when you're not on campus or what building you're at. And so as part of trying to be inclusive prior to COVID, we were trying to develop a comprehensive signage package and then it all got delayed. And um, needed lots of approvals and lots of things have happened since. But as part of those uh, plans, we developed this package with our signage designer, Volveresi, who I think also worked with the town a little bit on your signage package. Um, so it includes many types of signs. So it includes some signs that look like this, which are the sign that we're talking about today. There, there are only two of these, which are these gateway signs. It includes some vertical tavern sign type gateway signs are two of these, one of which is installed. There are, I'm gonna skip past a lot of these, a lot of these are drawings. Um, there are vehicular directional signs that are meant for viewing from uh, cars and at, at vehicular traffic speeds. There are smaller vehicular signs that are two posted signs. And then there are, those are street signs, I'm gonna skip past those. There are building signs, some of which 
are tavern signs for more notable buildings, most of which are smaller signs. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and pass forward to one of those one second. Um, smaller signs that are either double posted or here come the single posted ones. Um, here they are. And then a, a variety of other small kind of pedestrian wayfinding signs. And so the intent is that these are used as a system to direct people first when they get close to campus about where to enter campus. We don't have a lot of parking on campus proper, so to speak. We don't want a lot of people kind of, preferably we don't want people who don't know where they're going to take their vehicles into campus and find that they can't park anywhere. And so it's about getting people to parking lots and, and proper places to park. And then we have some kiosks with maps, which I'll get to in a minute or type F one second. Some kiosks with maps to help people orient themselves. And so it's all conceived as a, as a system. I heard, uh, I listened to your last meeting minutes and, and one of the things you brought up was some of, were some of the signs that we already have installed. All of those are coming down as part of this package. This is intended to be a comprehensive system that unifies the whole campus with a consistent set of graphics and iconography. It's a deep aubergine purple color, um, not too far from black, it's a really, really deep purple. We've got four prototype signs installed as part of this package. Um, the specific sign that we are talking about today, right, uh, is a sign that's on the town common. Uh, this is a photo montage. Um, I will say it's, this is a very tricky sign to montage because it's a curved sign on a sloping piece of land. Uh, and our signage consultants and our landscape architects did their best. Um, but this is one of the things that town council had asked for was a current um, photo montage that showed the existing condition as it exists today with our sign overlaid. And that's what this is. So I took this photograph and I'm standing uh, in the intersection. So this is as if you were driving through the intersection and it starts really low. So it starts at a curb height, right? So we were talking about a sign that starts at six inches high for this granite piece here. And then as the land slopes, you know, I mean, it's level, but as the land slopes, as you go around the corner from South Pleasant onto College Street, then the signs, the granite slowly picks up height. And at, at this point, it's intended to be a bench. So it's 18 inches high, which is a typical bench height, right? And at that point, it's intended to be a bench. And then, of course, uh, as it goes around the corner, it's curved. And then the, this part here is metal. And then it lands on some granite on the other side. Um, but it really is meant, well, of course, it's meant to be seen. But it, um, I really think that we've designed a sign that's meant to also be kind of seen through, seen around, right? It has presence, but it's not particularly tall. Um, and also it has this, of course, cut out kind of below it. Um, and so, of course, you're intended to see it, but you're also intended for it not to be the most kind of visually um, um, obtrusive thing on this corner. You can see a state highway sign and how big that is right here, right? So, um, and then as, as another comparison, just as to give you context, here is UMass's sign overlaid in red compared to ours. So, we have intentionally tried to be deferential to this corner. We've worked with uh, Department of Public Works and with the Planning Board and with MassDOT. We paid for some corner part of these corner improvements um, to try to make sure that we've designed a, a sign that we believe is um, is both a gateway but also isn't overly obtrusive. And I will stop there and uh, answer any questions that anybody has. Thank you. Um, do we, Nate, did you say that you had a, a comment from Madeline? No, you're muted. Oh, you're muted, Nate. <laughs> Thanks, that happens. Uh, I said th I, I thank uh, Seth for his presentation. And I was saying that <laughs> Madeline's a commissioner who can't attend tonight, but she wanted me to read uh, this statement. Uh, she said, although I'm unable to attend the commission's meeting, I'd like to express my thoughts regarding the Amherst College sign on the town common. While walking through town, I noticed that there's already a sign for Amherst College that is located nearby at the base of Johnson Hill. 
the sign is on Amherst College property and already serves to identify the college. The placement of the proposed sign gives the false impression that the southern section of the common is part of the college. Furthermore, the proposed 18 foot long purple sign uh, of unspecified material is not in keeping with the historic character of the common, which is designed by its defined by its simplicity, lack of street furniture, and clear view sheds. And so that was um, her statement. Okay, thank you. Um, do com commissioners wish to comment further? Uh, I I'm just curious about the sign. I, I know what sign Madeline is talking about. The, it's the road that goes up the hill to Johnson Chapel. Is that going to be part of this new signage? Or that sign is coming down. And what's going to replace it? There isn't a sign that says Amherst College there. There is a sign, well, sorry, there is a sign not at that exact location. The sign that replaces it is, I'll show you. There are two signs, which we call our secondary gateway signs, one of which is installed at the entrance to East Drive. The other one is this one. And But there's a version of this that doesn't say Quadrangle Drive, it says East Drive, that is currently in place. If you were to drive along College Street, opposite, Dick, opposite Dickinson Street, on the east end of kind of campus proper, there is, there's one of these signs installed. And this is the other one. But it doesn't go where that sign goes, it goes closer to the quadrangle uh, South Pleasant intersection. So would that not be a more appropriate place for this gateway sign that, that you're thinking of for the... Um... No, we don't, I mean, I mean, obviously this is a matter of opinion, but we don't believe so. We believe that we have located signs at a conceptual point at which the college has begun you know it's not of course exact we you have you know as you look at that corner we of course own the buildings on all three other sides of that corner so it's not as if you aren't seeing kind of Amherst College all around you but we feel like that that is a kind of a, a kind of ceremonial start of the campus if you will I'm just going to share my Thank screen you. uh Seth if you sure. I mean, I was in a, I'm just in Google Street View and they have more recent photos uh, from last fall. So here is the other sign on the East Drive. Yep. And so, you know, you can just see the kind of size and height of that. Um, just for reference. And if you turn around um, to your right. Facing the college or away from campus? Facing away from ca campus, just so you can just have an idea of other you're about to see if it's recent. Oh, it wasn't installed then. Okay. If you were to pass that exact spot right now, there is a right. campus map right where his cursor is. Uh, a little bit no, on the other patch of green. Yeah, right there. Here? Um, that exists and it's currently there. Yeah. Um, but it's not in this photograph of I'm not showing exactly. It's, it's, a, great, it's a great place for a sign, <laughs> I think. Um, which one, the common sign? I just want to the one on it. Dickinson Street at the bottom of Dickinson Street, because it connects with a um, crossroad, a cross path for past, for people walking um, onto that part of campus. I think I've made my thoughts pretty clear so far. I'm just going to say a couple of things. Um, I think the idea of a bench, the part of that part of the the base on which the sign rests. A, a bench at that location seems really funny to me. It's a pretty busy intersection in town, almost as busy as Main Street to Amity Street across Pleasant Streets. Um, I can't imagine anyone really wanting to sit there for any length of time um, when there are so many other nice places to sit. Um, <clears throat> I understand why there's a there's a base to support the sign, um, so that that takes up part of the height <laughs> that's been that's been designed so far. I still think the letters are too big. Um, I drove past Hampshire College today, and Hampshire College signs are big signs, but the lettering is actually small and. Um, and then they do what you're doing, which is to sort of play with what's the relationship of Amherst College to this road or this building, 
you know, in terms of a kind of lower or higher upper case lettering or size of lettering. Um, and you might want to take a look at that just for a comparison. You I, I have that overlay. Their sign's bigger than ours. I Actually, yeah. I can pull that up. Their, so, so in, their whole sign is bigger than ours. So, Seth, your sign is the smallest of all of our three colleges. In it the is, town. believe it or not. And I can, yeah. I, if you give me two minutes, I have that diagram. I can get it for you. You of course, know, not all we, not all the placements are the same, right? I yeah, I mean, we I mean, Hetty said that the sign, it kind of we call it the display area, right? Or background is uh, Amherst College might, um, you know, the relationship to the lettering to that might be different, but the overall lettering, I mean, right, Hetty, you were saying that the Amherst College lettering is actually taller than what would be on the other signs. I, I can't, mm -hmm. I don't know for sure, but the, that's I, what it's not, right. and I and I have it. I just have to pull it. Sorry, I didn't I didn't have that one ready, but I I do have it. I think the point has been made that the lettering is a certain size for visibility reasons. Right. It is. From 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 all sides of that intersection, which is a busy one. Um, it's also a traffic light, so it's it's not like people are going really fast through that intersection. Um, it's a major crossroads in town and I, I, I just, I still think there's a scale issue and the fact that it's part of town common is a little, a little overbearing um, to me, just kind of conceptually. Because it is, it is part of, part of the town common, the, the south part, the middle part and the north part that is being redesigned right now, um, as Madeline said in her in her note but so um i think that's a good point for me to jump in and share my comments i, I really appreciate the mock-up i felt like that actually helped me get a lot better sense of the scale and i was actually much less concerned about it um so that was um i think useful um and then you know i'm kind of i kind of feel like there is this I was going to describe it as a, um, uh, is it a Venn diagram where you have the overlapping circles? I mean, there is sort of this way that, you know, Amherst College overlaps into the town and, and, um, and that kind of, I can see the placement of it there as making sense because it really is kind of, the, to, to my mind, that is kind of the, you know, the cornerstone image of the college. I mean, in the same way that we come up through um, Northampton and you see the gates at Smith College. Um, so um, I'm I'm actually pretty, I'm pretty comfortable with it. So I just wanted to share I mean, that. Just as a matter of context, I, you know, the, I would say, you know, if you, the town of course has put out some new, uh, some new signs and uh, some of which are on Amherst, Co Amherst College property. And we negotiated that with the town at the time. Um, the sign as you come west on College Street that is in front of the Emily Dickinson Museum as a town of Amherst sign is twice as tall as our sign. So, and that's a town sign. So I think when we talk about, I understand the concerns about view sheds, but I think when you look at other reasonably comparable signs, we are significantly below anybody else's signs, right? The, the state DOT signs block the view sheds far more than ours do. Um, and of course, those are required by state regulations on on certain roads. Um, and I, you know, as far as simplicity goes, I think it's about as simple as it gets. You know, it is a, it's um, it does have a little bit of a contemporary feel. It's not, you know, it's not all stone, for example. Um, but that also gives a, a little bit of the lightness that we're going after. And so it is, a, you know, it's a really, really, yeah. That sign is twice as tall as our sign. Just as a reference, so that that's this the sign up until the point it says Amherst is forty two in up no up until that panel is forty two inches. Now where it says Amherst, there is forty two inches, right? Which is basically almost the height of our sign at its highest point. Um, so I, I, I mean I understand the concerns, but I, I do think that you know the sign as it's viewed as you go around a curving corner, you know, you're never seeing all of it kind of squarely, like you're seeing, 
sides that are rectangular. Right. And I think yeah. it will really do a lot to diminish its presence on the corner. To be honest, we studied smaller signs after uh, initial conversations and they looked so bad that we weren't even willing to consider them. At, at the gateway scale, they have to be a certain size or they just look almost laughable. Like it's like a clown car. Um, yeah. And so we, we tried and we couldn't find a scale that we really thought worked with the corner where this particular, you know, this sign is designed specifically for this location and not for anywhere else. And um, this is where we feel like we've kind of balanced the kind of right sense of scale. And I realize not everyone will agree. Um, I just wanted to invite Antonia and Michaela if they wanted to make a comment since they both have the connection to Amherst College. Yeah, or I not. think <laughs> um, I guess I completely understand what everything that's been said. And I think where I'm landing, I also think it's easier. And I appreciate the graphics that have been shown to understand, like with the scale of people and also the other locations of the building and how it would, I guess, fit into a larger um, priority of navigation. Um, and yes, although I do think it might, like the bench might feel a little bit funky and kind of maybe not super useful in that way. I do think that if it were smaller, um, it just would not also be seen via car, which is what I think most people are um, like entering off of um, uh, Route 9. Um, and so I think, I mean, I'm, I think I'm fine with it, um, especially given the overlap already between, which is does create problems, but I guess between the town and the college campus. Thanks. Yeah, I like the sign. And for me, my biggest qualm was the fact that the sign that already exists by the octagon at the bottom of Johnson Hill and the fact that that's, leaving and it's basically a complete rebrand of like wayfinding signs for the college makes it I don't know much better for me thank you okay oh Nate you're um there we go I'm muted. Yeah, I was gonna, I'm gonna share my screen one more time I don't know Pat if you shared any comments uh here is the the um you know the state sign uh this is the new sign actually which is pretty large, uh, you know, and then if we maintain, yeah, the dates change. The, um, I'm trying to stay with the more recent one. And there is the Samar Center sign and there's another sign here. Uh, I'm just, you know, in terms of height, uh, you know, the, you know, the sign is gonna be here and it won't be, you know, it'll be less than four feet. I, um, I mean, Seth, I'm interested, you know, in your comments about if the, you know, the granite stays the same, the plinth essentially, and, you know, would the lettering, would the college ever consider saying, I don't know how tall the letters are, but, you know, is it worth, you know, a, to Hetty's point and Madeline's, you know, instead of say they're 14 inches, could they be 12 inches or some proportionally small? Yeah, and we, we did study that, you know, it, it, the problem is you kind of have to proportionally lower everything else and it, it didn't, it didn't work. I thought it would. I, I, I'm... I I purposely had our science consultants and our landscape architects look at scaled down versions, and then they sent me renderings. And I said, we can't do that. If we're gonna do that, we shouldn't do it at all. Um, it just didn't look like it belonged. It wasn't, you know, if you're gonna do it, it has to be big enough to kind of have presence or it doesn't really work at all. Um, right. And would you, like right would now you... it really, oh, sorry. It really hugs the, I mean, in my mind, it hugs the curve nicely. I mean, I think there's, um, you know, like I said, the um, the mock up with the people really helped me get a perspective on, um, you know, how it's going to fit in there. It was very useful. I think the people are too big, though. I think I think they've been massaged. <laughs> purple, those purple people are a little bit bigger than they should be, um, based on just. Well, a like I, I just in again, it's a really hard Photoshop job to do because I bet. i'm so bad at doing it <laughs> you've got and i and that, i did not do this one but i've done them in the past and I, yeah. right and when you've got a curb sign on sloped land right it's really hard to try to get it all to feel like it really works and you aren't like standing crooked um we did our best um 
but you know the drawings do show you know it obviously does hug the curve um it hugs a curve that was specifically designed for it to hug with conversations with the town and with the and with uh, the state right yeah. um and so of course if it doesn't go in then it wouldn't hug anything but um all of that corner was worked on the idea that the sign might be there so those were conversations with uh guilford mooring and the town and making sure the view sheds all work with cars that are turning the corners and there aren't any conflicts with people seeing other people as they try to turn the corner um you know i i we can of course respectfully disagree on whether or not it's appropriately scaled or not um but this is the sign that we've proposed okay well thank you for coming and speaking with us yes um, thank you appreciate uh the conversation and um hope this has been useful <laughs> of course anything else nate uh, no, I don't think so. I, yeah, I mean, thanks, Seth. You know, we had communicated last month. And so, you know, I shared the information Seth provided in terms of what their consultant said, you know, designing the sign for visibility and then, you know, the mocked up um, photo. So, I, you know, I, it was just really just to continue that conversation. So thanks, Seth. Of course. Thank you. Have a, have a good night. You too. Okay, um, so getting back to our agenda, um, we were talking about um, item number four. I don't think we've made any progress on inventory form updates, although it is uh, our intention. We of course had um, 40 or 55, 55 South Pleasant Street has come down. Um, has What's the uh, status of 45, Nate? Is that? I, th I thought it was, um... I, I honestly, I didn't look today, but I thought they were going to be working on that if it hasn't already started. So they put chain link fence all around the number 45, um, you know, between the buildings and between the building and the Emma Cinema. Um, so I, I thought I heard a date like towards the end of the middle or the end of May, but I, I know it's happening. Yeah, maybe with the opening of the store. Uh, they were going to, you know, just probably a few things, um, but yeah, I mean, the 55's down, it came down pretty fast. It didn't actually, I was, I was curious, I was watching, I went over there every, a few times and took some pictures. Um, I don't know, I was, you know, there wasn't a lot to it, actually. <laughs> I'm not, yeah, I'm not surprised after having been in it. Um, yeah, I was, I went around to see if there were, you know, kind of good any good relics and the rubble that <laughs> such luck. <laughs> <laughs> um, and do we have a, I know that uh, our Southeast street property, uh, um, a mayor, where, where are we with that? Because that we had the demolition delay had expired. Um, yeah, so for... And we were, he was going to let me know when they were going to schedule the demolition. So I could arrange to be there to take a look at the framing and that sort of thing. And, yeah, so there's um, you know, there's a new building down on Southeast Street behind the Savings Bank, you know, one thirty three, one forty three, and then across the street, the 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 owner and developer owns the three properties that we had looked at and allowed. Um, you know, they they could have been demolished, but it's all expired, so he has to reapply to the commission. So okay. he, you know, they didn't uh, uh, file a building permit in time, and I think they're reconsidering the plans. I think they want to move forward, but maybe not um, on pace as, as what they thought. So, you know, when they want to move forward again, they're going to have to submit demolition applications for those three properties all over again. Okay. So they'll be coming before us again, but we pretty much know the lay of the land. Okay. Right. And I think, you know, maybe at that point, uh, you know, we could make sure we have the photographs or documentation we would need for inventory forms or updated forms. Yeah. I mean, I did a pretty thorough accounting yeah. when I was there. The only things that I want to, um, yeah, that I wanted to keep mind of are that um, I did get, I think uh, Eric Rodoya said he had somebody who might want the granite facing on the foundation. And, right. um, and then we talked about, I think I talked to Jan about the, um, 
those wide plank pine boards, which would be great to salvage. Um, right. So it sounds like it's not coming down anytime. It's going. It's going. I'm going to know before they take it down. <laughs> They're gonna need need me, right? Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. That's good. I was just thinking in terms of timing. So. So do know. do do we have photos and information? I think that was what we charged the owners with was to get the photos and. No, and no. We had a site up. visit. Hetty and I went. We had a site visit, and I took um, photos all inside and out, and I've done a bunch of the research on it. So I want to prep a particularly since it's in that um, East uh, East Amherst area, I want to prep a form B for it so that it goes into the record. It's high on the priority list. Great, thank you, Robin. Yeah, sure. Um, okay, so that's item number four. Uh, item number five, again, um, discussion of one and five year goals. I don't know if anybody has any questions. Uh, I am not, unfortunately, again, in a position to have any updates, but... Um, Hope springs eternal. <laughs> Anyone's thoughts for right now? No, okay. Um, I think the um, you know, the new planner. I went over a few of them with her. Okay. And it could be that with that extra help, uh, we could you know talk about one or two or you know what we'd like to see um, happen and right. You know, she, right. She, I think she'll have some time to be able to um, put towards okay. something. So. Okay, well, that's a good segue into number six, which is um, with, where are we at? What month is it? It's May already. How is it May already? Um, so CPA opens in what, September? Applications open in September, but I'm starting to get emails about upcoming meetings. And um, last year we were at an impasse. Um, we had a property uh, at the base of, uh, Route 9 coming into town, um, uh, app, a private property applicant that was requesting funds to relocate their house on a new foundation because they've had, I think, four separate traffic incidents because of how close they are to the road. Their house is in the National Register. Um, there's, I noticed, uh, I think after the meeting, when I took a closer look at it in person, I did notice that they fully enclosed the porch, which I think has damaged some of the integrity in that particular property. But the upshot of the um, CPA meeting was that the, the, the committee in the town need to determine guidelines around um, how to consider funding for private property owners. And so I just wanted to put that on an agenda item and that would actually be really great if we had just town help in that regard because it's something that really has to kind of come from the town but maybe engage with the commission um, to balance somehow the value of preserving private property that has a substantial public view and therefore public benef benefit. Um, with all the competing interests of um, CPA funds. And one of the things that I had thought about whether the town could explore was um, allowing homeowners, uh, residential homeowners, the opportunity to, to have an interest-free loan, which is something that you do in other government programs like housing rehab, as sort of an in-between where we wouldn't just be granting you know, having being overwhelmed with applications for um, historic preservation uh, CPA funds from private homeowners, but um, it's sort of it's a curious question. Um, as an owner of a I had an 1860 uh, Creek Revival house on Halleck Street that I always wanted to do get the um, it's an oval window that's original and I wanted to get it um, reglazed, but never had the money to do so. Like that would have been. You know, if I'd known about CPA funds back then, I might have applied for it. But um, I think there's hesitation on, you know, the part of some members of the town that that's not really what CPA funds are for. And you know, so it's kind of a um, something to something to explore because uh, mainly because private homeowners uh, who have buildings that are substantially, you know, historic and good good um, representations of our historic inventory often 
get stuck because they're so expensive to maintain and things like porches and windows and that sort of thing um, are a real challenge. Um, but um, I don't know how the town as a whole feels about that. So that's why I thought I would put that on an as agenda item, something that we could carry forward and help to get some more feedback and thought on what a good policy would be. Yeah, I think um, I'll jump in, you know, uh, a few years ago, Ben, the previous planner, I looked at, you know, uh, in using CPA funds for housing or conservation, you have to put a permanent deed restriction on a property or location. And so, you know, it's, you know, forever, essentially, but um, the statute for historic preservation isn't, um, doesn't require that. And so some communities don't have a preservation restriction, or they have them for only certain instances. And so we've actually moved to having a local restriction 99 years on uh, projects. And so there's a few that are in final phase right now that, you know, just the commission would approve with the private entity, and then it'd be recorded against the deed. Uh, but if it's in perpetuity, it has to go to mass historic and it becomes a little bit bigger process, a little more cumbersome. Uh, but there has been some discussions about, you know, are there, a, is there a dollar threshold that over which the town wouldn't fund a private property? Um, or is it proportional to say the project or value of the building? And then what is the right term? And so, uh, you know, there's, you know, like for instance, we funded churches uh, and other organizations in terms of their building. But if a private homeowner came in and said, oh, I'd love to just replace my slate roof, you know, is it, is it, you know, is the property significant enough to, to have that? And so I think to me, some of the process would be, you know, what's the value in the structure? Is it, you know, is it, how significant is it, you know, is it in a district? Is it, you know, it has to be more than just inventory. And then, you know, what kind of restriction would there be? I think it's a really good question, Rob, and I also agree that, you know, some of the older homes, they are expensive to maintain and and keep some of that historic fabric. And so, you know, I the finest director before we left, we talked about it because Springfield does that in some some of their local historic districts or historic areas, but they, they actually have a cap on how much uh, an owner can apply for. And I don't yeah. know if it's for a lifetime or for over 10 years or whatever, but it's, you know, it's a, it's a fair amount, but, you know, for instance, we funded the restoration of the steeple at JCA, the Jewish community of Amherst for um, 220,000, the South Congregational Church for a fair amount. We're helping with the roof restoration uh, and the North Congregational Church, formerly the North Congregational Church. Uh, the Ithmar Conkey Stevens House, which is a uh, Salem Place condominium. There's the, the individually listed structure. Uh, there's still some funding that the board may vote to uh, use to restore the exterior we had voted a barn restoration on West Street uh, and the owners end up um, rescinding the money because of the restriction. There was concerns about what that meant. It was an older uh, owner and they were worried about what that would mean. And it was a fair amount of money to restore the barn. It's one of the last remaining dairy barns. You can see um, you know, a little south of Mount Holyoke Drive if you're going um, south on 116. I still think it would be something that'd be, you know, that one is really part of the view shed and there's one of the older farms on the road that and another one across the street and that barn has since been taken down. Uh, it was in a really bad shape a few years ago. So I, yeah, I think it's something that's worth considering. And so I'm not saying all this because I think with affordable housing, it's really clear. Oh, we give money to an organization, no matter how little or how much you get a permanent deed restriction for the property. You buy a property with conservation for conservation purposes, you get a restriction in perpetuity. You fund a restoration of a property for $150,000 with historic preservation funds, and there's no clear guidelines or rules, and communities across the state do it differently. And I think there's confusion, you know, or Robin said maybe, if not confusion, just some, you know, some kind of a little more um, trepidation about how our public funds use on private property. And so if we were to propose this for the CPA committee next fall, when they're starting their round, we should you know, have maybe a nice memo or some, you know, something that we could provide them and have guidance for applicants. And so. Nate, the, there's a big difference between Salem Place, the Conkley Stevens house right. and the building on route nine coming into Amherst from Hadley. Mm -hmm. um, I happen to be driving by and there's, there is, um, there are weeds growing out of the top of the roof, the roof line. Um, and that's what I said, the porch has been enclosed. So it's it's not looking 
it doesn't look very prestigious. Let's put it like that. Um, even though it is at a very important sort of gateway into town. Um, I just want so to. Yeah, to... I think that, I mean, it's such, it's a good point because, uh, you know, one of, so I have four things here, right? So there's, there's, there's three different issues. There's um, how the money could be awarded, you know, so whether we wanted to consider a program that, you know, did um, zero interest loans on upon sale or transfer of the house. There's the preservation restriction term, which has been an issue that we've talked a long, about, about for a long time. Then there's the issue in terms of preservation restrictions, uh, which I keep bringing up, which is um, who's running our, who, who I think enforcing is the right word, who is managing our, our restrictions because those preservation restrictions um, in a in a program that's managed by somebody like Historic New England, like they are visited by whoever holds the restriction is visited by a member of the uh, the, the entity that holds that holds the restriction for an you know an inspection, not a you know not a gotcha inspection, but you know there's no point <laughs> in having a preservation restriction if you're not going to engage with. The property owner about how to properly preserve the house and um, encourage them to contact you. I mean, I think there's there's both a lot of fear among people who are don't want to take the money because they don't want the restriction. Um, because what if they have to change the windows or what if they have to change the roof? And those are all things I think that the um, restriction holder can agree to given you know appropriate circumstances. So that's like a whole other piece. But the other thing I was going to say is if if we're gonna continue, and I would like us to continue to fund privately held property, whether it's you know the, the Women's Club or Sale in Place, um, you know, in other places that I've worked where there have been um, grant competitions, there have been scoring sheets. And I tried to, look, to do a little bit of work with that with the CPA committee, but there was a lot of hesitation to kind of stick to one scoring chart. But at the same time, I feel like, you know, how do you compare um, sale in place and, um, you know, whatever uh, the house is on uh, North Pleasant Street, and it helps your case if someone is turned down to have, you know, here are the criteria by which we evaluated you, you know, was your house on the National Register, you know, five points, right? Um, you know, I mean, I, I, I don't know what the criteria would be, but I just feel like we're constantly walking through this murky water about, you know, everything is, everything can be significant one way or the other. And it's, you know, it's kind of like how many points do you get to bring it up to the point where you feel like, you know, it's warrant, the funding is warranted to help help preserve that resource. It's very tricky. Yeah, I, I, I was going to say, I think it I think it'll be good for the commission to have this on a future agenda. Uh, you know, last year I did get a few calls from private property owners who lived in an old house. You know, there's a few of them actually when they kind of heard about this and said, oh, I'd like CPA money just so I can fix up my house. It's old. You know, right. it wasn't like, oh, you know, what's the contribution to the town or what's the significance? They just think, oh, here's maybe some available funding. I don't necessarily disagree with them, but, you know, we have to, you know, Typically, we would have said no, or right. you know, let's do. We have to do some research, but I think that right. more and more people are learning about CPA, and yeah. I think we just have to. It would be nice to have some guidelines, you know. Yeah, I mean, yeah. And it could be something like you know, specifically for the the preservation, of, like something like excuse me, specifically for the preservation of a character defining feature, you know. So we've got these, you know, like the Salem Conkey House has those beautiful. Um, rounded windows and you know if you fill in the top section like you see in a lot of places and put in a vinyl replacement window like you really lost a lot of the character like that might be a more directed way to offer funding you know to say like okay here's you know something that's significant and here's a piece of it you know maybe it's the slate roof or you know a porch or something like that that's really ties um, ties it together so that's one idea just off the top of my head <laughs> okay well, yeah, no, it seems like um, it would be great. And and if we could have a somebody, uh, another staff person with background, that would be great. <laughs> so 
Um, let's carry carry that forward. Do you, does anyone else have other comments? Okay. Um, uh, it is time for public comment then. Agenda item number seven. Let's see, there is one attendee. Uh, no, that's just Seth. Seth is still in the attendees, but we don't have any other members of the public. Unless you're seeing something I don't, Nate. I know I don't see anyone. Okay. Um, so in that case, we're uh, in, un unanticipated items. I just wanted to ask, um, I meant to review my list before I came on here, but I wanted to ask, um, uh, Hattie and I talk all the time, so I'm just going to direct this to Pat uh, and Tony and Michaela. Can you guys each remind me what was what you're most interested in doing some background work on between meetings? And I can see if I can get an email to out to you about um, you know like moving moving things forward because I, I apologize for for the delay on that. But um, I, Antonia, I think, or maybe it was Michaela. I'm not sure which one of you is looking going to look into um, um, getting demolition signage. I asked a um, question. That was me. I think the only issue and the reason why I have not been able to do it is since I'm abroad. So I'm not oh. physically, um, but I will be back like um, in the fall and also be back in the U.S. in three weeks. So oh, okay. it will be okay. easier, I think, okay. to do that once I'm physically there. Okay, great. Yeah. Thanks. Oh, and hey. where are you again, Antonia? I'm in Spain. Okay. And how is it there? <laughs> great. I love it. Oh. Good, good. Uh, it's nice. It's still nice and chilly here. Well, I guess it got warm today, but <laughs> That's um, warm. Kayla, what were you hoping to jump into? Um, it's interesting because it's kind of relevant, but about I was supposed to be working with Pat on CPA funding guidelines was something I thought was important for moving forward with the council or okay. the commission. Okay. Yeah. And, and yeah. That that interests me as well. And and I know you sent out some assignments, Robin, and I, I quite honestly thought we would have some discussion about to what extent um, the product or the goal should be for those assignments. Um, so that's kind of where I am. And I apologize because I haven't started working on any of it. Um, oh, I know. I haven't either. I mean, I had sort of uh, intended to email you all and kind of get, you know, balls rolling in different directions and I hadn't. So I thought this was a good time just to check in and um, motivate me to, to, to do that. And, and we'll, we'll figure out by our next meeting, some areas where we all feel like we could try to make a little progress myself included. Sure. Okay, great. Uh, okay. Anything else, Nate? Yeah, I was gonna, I just have a few things. Uh, the planning board meets next week on the 15th and I'll probably be discussing the preservation plan with them, the updated version. Uh, Shannon, I, I think I'd let her know, but I'll try to reach out to her. Uh, anyways, it's, you know, typically we ask that they adopt it and incorporate it into the master plan. And then, you know, just to help, uh, you know, let it, you know, kind of educate them on it. And uh, so that'll be happening next week. If anyone wants to attend, it you know just Wednesday? be an informal discussion with them, but I think it'll be helpful. When's the uh, meeting? Sorry, what? When is the meeting? Uh, Wednesday, the I guess it's the fifteenth already. I can't believe that. Um, and uh, then what at then, seven or six? Or uh, seven or they start at six thirty. I think it'll okay. be the first or second thing on the agenda, but okay. Yep. Yeah. Right. Um, there's a few demolition applications that are coming in, so the next meeting. You know, if it's in early June, would probably also double as a um, a public hearing. There's uh, 107 Blue Hills Road. I think I'd emailed the commission some images. There's a like a cold storage. Oh, right. Structure, uh, and I think that you know that'll um, probably go to a hearing. Uh, and then there's an older structure on Main Street, and attached to it is a something from the. Um, gosh, maybe the 50s or 60s, but the structure itself that it's attached to is a bit quite a bit older and it meets our definition of demolition, even though they're not going to do anything to the, the um, original structure, they meet the 25% of a removal of the facade. So that may come to a hearing. Uh, the building commissioner is going to look at it. I think the, the 
the newer addition might be in such bad shape that it could qualify as an emergency demolition. Um, What's the number, Nate? Uh, it's 699 Main Street. Uh, yeah, I think people call it like 707. There's two buildings on the property. It's actually the building Dorsey Memorial. So there's a three bay, uh, open three bay kind of barn attached to the back of what is Dor Dorsey Memorial. And that it's just that three bay area. And, and it looks like from the Sanborn maps that it was possibly a blacksmith shop. And then Nate, I found, um, I have to get these files to you. I have a set of Sanborn maps that I took um, photos of, not even the ones that I sent you, but a later version. It's kind of cool because it's like 1930 to 1950. So you, they actually just like cut and paste overlay so you can right. see like the map change. And in that version, it looks like it turned into a store. So it'd be interesting uh, property to do some research on. I'm really curious about, oh, you, you saw know, store. just kind of what it I, was. I found the maps. I think I saw the blacksmith shop in the 19. So the, the original building was built sometime between 1910 and 1930, probably. Right. It was a, a appeared in the 1930 Sandboard map, I think as a blacksmith shop. I didn't see it as a store, but maybe, oh, maybe, I was thinking it was for storage, a storage building. But um, in any event, there could be a third demolition application, 68 McClellan. It's a, it's a, a, an existing single family home that had been on the market uh, by the owner, but the owner is, I think, deciding to um, tear it down and build a new structure. And so uh, that has to go both before the the historical commission and then also the local historic district and so um the owner is hoping okay. to have that you know so, uh, they've already submitted the application and it's we'll probably need a hearing in june as well so if it's in a local historic district and they okay a demolition we can still impose a demolition delay is that how that works or yeah, yep. Yeah, there's two different bylaws, so okay. it could be an inconsistent decision. Um, but... Okay, okay, all right. Yeah, I don't, you know, the building commissioner is like, well, that's fine, right? There's different kind of purposes. You know, the local historic district, for instance, might say, wow, architecturally, the building is not, you know, it's not necessarily worth preserving, right? But the commission could say, well, what it represents in terms of, you know, whether it's a certain time period or something or what happened there, that's important to the you know, history of the town. It's a little bit different than say that just the visual appearance of the building. Um, right, right. I'm looking at it right now. Yeah, it's kind of, um, you know, almost like a worker housing kind of. Right. It's a very modest house with an awesome little modest uh detached garage which is always a soft spot on my heart <laughs> yeah i think the garage is i think from the 50s yeah yeah the, the house has a, a crawl space i think that's about three or four feet and i okay. think it's actually pretty wet um oh okay okay interesting it's like up on a little mound all right yeah also tonight the there's a special meeting to look at the um change some changes to the war memorial pool Mm. Um, the okay. meeting was from 7 to 8.30, so obviously I'm not going to make it. Um, but it's a place in Amherst that's very dear to my heart, um, up by the high school. Hey, it's only 7.30. You know, if you're really up for a marathon, you could. <laughs> Two meetings. In... <laughs> it's in a glutton for punishment, I think. <laughs> um, and then uh, just another uh, thing that crossed my radar. Um, uh, I noticed that I got a mailing or an emailing from Historic Deerfield. Deerfield. They have a um, an exp an exhibition called "Unnamed Figures: Black Presence and Absence in Early in, in the Early American North," which um, I don't know. Maybe we might want to organize um, field trip. Field trip, yeah. Um, uh, to get a sense of you know how we begin to look at and cover our um, our divergent. Uh, historic narratives of our, our town and our area. When are you back from Spain, Antonia? I come back May 26. Okay. And do you go home or are you be in Amherst? I'm, I'm going home, so okay. I won't be in Amherst till. Is it Chicago? Are you in Chicago? Is that right? Uh, New York. So. Yeah. Oh, okay. All right. Okay. okay. Anybody else? All set. Okay. All right, one hour, not bad. <laughs> Do we need a motion to adjourn or? Uh, 
I think Nate technically can. I can just adjourn the meeting, right? Anything else, Nate? I think we should. Set oh no, the we know we're not. Yeah, we have to schedule our next meeting. I'm so eager to. Uh, <laughs> that's always the last agenda item. Um, so we are meeting on the 6th, so a month would put us uh, at June 3rd, uh, if we do a Monday. Does that work with everyone's calendars? Mm -hmm. Yep, yeah. Thumbs up, thumbs up you, Pat, yes? Yes, yes, I did say yes. Okay, great, great. Up. Um, so if for some reason that change changes, do you let us know, because we're... Um, uh, we want to maintain quorum. <laughs> so yeah, and, yeah, well, um, and, and because I'll opt to submit a legal ad in the next probably you know seven eight days just to advertise that as a public hearing. So oh okay, so you know, public hearings yeah. have like a further uh, timeline out. Is that right for advertisement? Well, we need a two week advertisement, and then it takes oh, okay. a number of, a few days lead time. So okay, I, mean, I have a little bit of time, but I just okay. Okay, so we will schedule for uh, June 3rd then, Monday, June 3rd at 6.30. Great. Right. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank okay. you. Thank okay, you. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Have a good night. Yeah, everyone. Uh, adjourned, 7.36. <laughs> thanks, everyone. All right. Bye. Bye.